just before Christmas, I released a video dealing with the question of the amount of value created per hour by British workers. There were lots of comments about that video and people were asking whether I correctly dealt with unequal exchange. Did I deal adequately with proceeds of imperialist exploitation? So I'm releasing a, another short video dealing with that. The question was whether I accounted for the proceeds of imperialist exploitation in my calculation of the value created by workers in Britain. Well, the simple answer is that the national accounts don't include property income from abroad as part of the national product. Since I use the net national product as the starting point of my calculations, this automatically excludes value arriving from property income abroad. That's the simple answer. There's a more complicated second answer one could give, which is that in fact the UK runs a net deficit on, prop on the property income account. This means that the interest, profit and rent paid to individuals and firms outside the UK is greater than that that is paid to individuals and firms in the UK from outside. So that a portion of the surplus value being extracted from UK workers is in fact being appropriated by overseas capitalists and firms and that this surplus extracted by foreign capital exceeds the surplus that UK capital extracts from foreign workers. Now you can see that by looking at the, um, the balance of payment statistics I've got given them since 1990 and you can see that other than a short period from 1998 to let's say 2005 the UK has not been running a, a surplus on the investment income account. Um, most years it runs a deficit, quite a considerable deficit. But what about the unequal exchange argument? One comment asked if it could really be true that workers in the USA were more exploited than workers in India. This was after um, a viewer had contributed calculations for the US figures. Uh, surely imperialism leads to unequal exchange whereby surplus is transferred from Indian workers to US workers, they asked. Well, this idea is absolute nonsense. It's not only nonsense, it's pernicious nonsense and anti-working class nonsense. It's a pre-Marxist idea. The notion that profit arises from unequal exchange is tempting, but it's not what Marxism is about. Capital, and before that, the poverty of philosophy, are polemics by Marx against the prudentless notion that profit arises from unequal exchange. Marxism came into being as a tendency in a polemic against these positions. And on the contrary, Marx shows that surplus value arises on the basis of equal exchange. It's also a reformist idea. If profit arises from unequal exchange or from, from monopoly, it implies that you could get rid of it either by instituting free and fair markets or by abolishing monopolies. Marx says no, only abolishing the wages system will do, it, do the trick. We still have the question, why are wages lower in India? If there's no unequal exchange, why are Indian wages so much lower than US wages? Surely unequal exchange is the only explanation viable for this. No. The cause is the much lower development of the forces of production in Indian capitalism compared to American capitalism. We're going to look at two key industries, ones which you can measure the output in physical quantity terms, agriculture and steel. And we'll see just by how much Indian capitalism lags behind US capitalism. Let's look at agriculture first. Now, although the US has a considerably smaller population than India, about a quarter of the size of Indian population, it produces almost twice as much grain. 
and it produces 470 million tons of grain using just under 1 million workers. India on the other hand produces 267 million tons of grain using just over 42 million workers. One agricultural worker in India produces on average 6.3 tons of grain. One in America produces 438 tons of grain. So the value created by a year's farm labor in the US is roughly 70 times what a year's farm labor will create in the, the Indian uh, economy. Now if we shift from paying attention to agriculture to steel, we see that actually both India and the USA are big steel producers. And they produce almost exactly the same amount of steel, 87 million tons or 88 million tons. But the US produces its 88 million tons with just under 100,000 workers. This was in 2014, which is the last year for which I could get comparable figures for both India and the US. The Indian steel industry has grown considerably since then. The number of workers in India in 2014, there were 667,000. So each Indian steel worker produced 130 tons. Each Indian, um, each American steel worker produced 885 tons. Now, steel is a relatively advanced capital sector of the Indian economy. So the relative difference in productivity between the US and India is much smaller. It's large scale capitalist industry in both cases. But American capitalism is 6.7 times as productive and therefore an American worker producing steel produces 6.7 times as much value. If Indian and US steel are sold on a third market, let's say in Egypt, they'll both sell for the same price. One ton of US steel and one ton of Indian steel have the same value. The US steel contains about one sixth the labor, or a bit less than one sixth the labor. So one hour of a US steel worker creates six times as much value as one hour by a, an Indian steel worker. Why is this? Value is not determined by the actual duration an individual worker spends, it's determined by the labor time that's socially necessary. And if too much labor time is spent making things using less productive techniques, that labor will not count equally as value. This is absolute basic labor theory of value set out in the first chapters by Marx. And some people pretend, pretend in the sense of claim to be Marxist Leninists, and they are propagating theories of value which have nothing to do with Marx whatsoever. The, when calculating um, value created in the USA or UK, you do not have to take into account any unequal exchange. The whole point of Marx's analysis in the first chapter of Capital is that Commodity exchange is a system of exchange of equivalence. Commodity exchange establishes a set of equivalence relationships. The question is what underlies these equivalence relationships? He says that within an economy that is relatively um, well developed, that is set by the amount of labor time required to produce things. And when you get a transition between different modes of production between handicraft and machine industry is the machine industry, the most advanced technique that sets the standard. A, Marx also says in Capital that the labor of more productive nations counts 
as more value creating than the labor of less productive nations. So the notion of unequal exchange and explaining the lower wages in India due to unequal exchange is completely wrong. It leads no one towards a policy which could resolve the situation because the only way it can be resolved is by rapid development of the productive forces in India. If you compare the rate of change of wages in India with those in China, see wages under the Chinese mixture of socialism and state capitalism have risen very rapidly. Those in India have stagnated. That's because China has rapidly developed the productive forces, whereas India has not. 